Okay, hello everybody, we're ready to start. Uh, thank you for coming along. Uh, we're gonna have the, whoa. test, test, one, two. Uh, we're gonna have the CIPC Building Simulation Awards 2023. So, what is gonna happen today, more or less? We're a bit behind in terms of program, but we're gonna get there. Uh, so we'll start with a small welcome from our Chair of the Building Simulation Group, Darren Wolf. Then we'll have the presentations of the finalists of the main awards. Uh, after that, we'll have an introduction from our secretary, Vasily Kiel, who's sitting over there, for the Young Modelers Awards. Then we'll have a panel with a sponsor on future innovation of building simulation. And finally, we'll have the results for the awards. So, Darren, do you want to get all yours? Welcome to the awards. Before we get into the awards, um, I'm just going to give a, uh, take the opportunity to give a very, very quick overview of what we've been up to in the Building Simulation Group um, over the last year, which I chair. Um, we were established in 2009, and earlier on this year, we actually had our 60th meeting. We're up to about 64, 65 now. And sometimes it's quite good to look at who do we actually, uh, our demographics. And that pie chart there um, shows from different parts of the world the SIBSI members of all different grades that are uh, receiving um, things from the building simulation group. And if you can see there, we've got um, quite a good spread beyond the UK with three large contingents in Hong Kong, Australia, New Zealand and Ireland. And as a group, we're always looking to see how we can move outside London even, um, more into the regions and to abroad. So if anyone has any ideas um, how they would like to interact with the building simulation group, please do come and contact us and let us know. Um, the other statistics there relate our um, subscribers um, to SIBC. There's um, over almost 13,000 people that um, get subscribed to what we're doing. But in particular, the mailable contacts is the tick box where you say you want to receive information from our group. And we've had um, a growth in all areas, but in particular, almost a 50% increase there. So please do tick our box and you hear a lot more about Building Simulation Group. Broadcasting, we've got a number of um, areas. Well, obviously, we organize events by the committee. We've got blogs. Please do look at our blog on the website. Quite often, we do an event that's a reflection of what's going on in the um, industry, and we guide our publications towards that as well. Uh, typically, there'll be 40 or 50 people in person at our events, and maybe the same again or more online. And then um, we have our presentations ar archive and LinkedIn as well. So again, please do have a look to see what we're doing. Uh, we do do quite a lot over the course of the year and um, hopefully you find it interesting. So this is um, a picture of an uh, event we held um, in October. It was a neighbors event through the lens of the modeler and two members of the independent design review. Um, so, you know, again, this was um, looking at modeler's perspective and the IDR, and uh, it was a fantastic event, well attended. Um, please do have a look at our events coming up. There might be a one on AI next year. We don't know yet, I'm saying now, because anyone who's uh, involved in AI, please let yourself known to our group, and uh, we might be able to get you involved in that event. Then there's the uh, Building Simulation Awards. Um, this was uh, us last year um, on the awards. This is our main event of the year. Um, it can be six months worth of, uh, of a lot of hard work in the background to actually get to this um, point. And these were our uh, two uh, winners. There was uh, Daniel on the Building Simulation Award and there was our Young Model Award, Sveta, who's here in the audience. Hands up, make yourself known. There we go. So there's our winner from last year. If, you wanna, um, if you're thinking about uh, applying for the awards next year, whether on either of the categories, you know, please do come and talk to us or Sveta on the Young Modeler side. We launched our group Vision well over a year ago, but it actually went on our website um, this year. 
and um, we've got a whole host of different things that we've got within that vision so please do have a look at that it took a, a lot of time to pull it together and every now and again we like to dip back into this vision and see whether what our group activities whether they're aligning um, with that vision so it's a live document um, including basic and ultimate modeling types of 2050 and what not to model so please do have a look at our vision and we've got a whole host of publications that um, we've been doing or, or, or bubbling away in the background. So you may have been seeing the um, TM69 uh, uh, Dynamic Thermal Modelling of Basic Blinds. It's a very successful. Um, it was one of the uh, most popular uh, downloads in 2023. Uh, we had this uh, Grow Your Knowledge uh, webinar with over 500 people in there. Um, and recently we've got a blog update which uh, covers the journey of TM69 um, and we've got additional possible publications, AM11 update um, and one on occupant behaviour as well and if you're interested in these please do let yourself know and we'll see whether we can uh, tie you in to the uh, and support those publications. And on TM69 um, on a number of occasions I've been asking for help um, TM69 was a basic blinds um, and we're looking to see whether we can do a publication on advanced blinds. So there's all those um, categories there that you've got up on the screen um, and we're basically saying if you're um, involved in dynamic thermal modelling and you've done any of those uh, categories of advanced blinds or you've got some ideas on how you might uh, wish to push that forward, again please make yourself known. So now I'm going to hand over to Alex here, capable hands. So, how this uh, process is going to run, we have six finalists who are going to present. We actually have five here today. Actually, one have flew all over from Egypt just to be here today, which is great. Um, and then we have a lovely judging panel, so we, which is headed by Gabriella from Useful Simple and then we, ha whoops, we have Baran from Ott McDonald and we have Rikia from UCL. Um, so how the process is going to run essentially we're going to have every uh, person presenting for five minutes, exactly five minutes and they stop and then we have one or two minutes of Q&A from a judging panel and this is going to happen six times and hopefully by the end of that point we'll be able to identify who is the winner and the two runner-ups. So our finalists, um, apologies in advance if I say your name wrong. Uh, so we have Dahlia from Dark Group, we have Daniel from Rich and Zaffin, George from Silence Earth, Julia from Hilsomoran, Prefthi, who is actually from the Netherlands and is already connected via Teams, and then we have Ross from Eurohappled. So if we are ready, you're first, sorry, Dahlia, you're first, no, no, you're first, you're first, you're first. Hi everyone, my name is Dalia Khalil. I'm here to present, sorry, I'm here to, pre to present DOR. First, I'd like to thank Sipsi Building Simulation Group for this opportunity. Our topic today is delivering climatized outdoor retail experience in the Gulf. During the next five minutes, I'll walk you through a quick presentation showing the impact of building simulation tools in construction industry. But first, let me brief you about DOR. DAR is an international multidisciplinary consulting organization with five main design centers and more than 300 offices around the world. <clears throat> Our project today is called Juan Island. Located in Doha, Qatar, uncovering over 67 hectares, the project is intended to be an extension of the Perth project, offering living spaces, retail areas, and entertainment. Juan Island Central Spine, which is the crystal walkway, is considered the world's largest open-air retail area. The objective of the study was to provide unique thermal experience to the shoppers and diners by alleviating the impact of increment weather conditions and by maintaining a comfortable microclimate throughout the year. ANSYS and IES were both used during the study. 
The challenges we faced during the study was that the uh, crystal walkway and adjacent promenade area were subjected to unsheltered winds, high solar loads, severe ambient conditions reaching up to 46 degrees, and re high relative humidity creating an even more elevated temperature sensation. But the main challenge we faced was in properly estimating the cooling load due to large volumes of hot air infiltration, and that was the main focus of the study. Accordingly, we implemented a microclimate strategy that incorporates passive measures coupled with active integrated measures where required. The thermal comfort uh, assessment was done by thermal comfort indices such as SET and UTCI. An early assessment for the project was conducted using DTM to investigate on a macro scale the different mitigation measures and to obtain the boundary conditions that are then used in the CFD model, along with the base estimate for the cooling load. The distribution of comfort and discomfort hours throughout the year illustrate the effect of incorporating shading, wind, and uh, uh, active measures on the perception of thermal comfort and confirms that thermally comfortable outdoor areas can be achieved in hot and, and uh, humid climates. As a passive strategy, a protected space is created within the central spine by shading structures and trees to provide shade and at the same time improve the containment of cold supply below it and maintain lively but not excessively turbulent environment. Several CFD models were conducted in order to get the exact configuration for the landscape as will be shown later. On the other hand, targeted active strategy was achieved by using integrated cooling system within the architectural, structural and landscape elements. The shading columns and landscape features will be used to supply air at low level where air totem will be strategically placed to uh, provide adequate coverage for, uh, of cold air without affecting the open spaces and views. Furthermore, supply diffusers were integrated in the building skin. These are detailed sketches showing how cold air is supplied, and this layout shows the different cooling uh, system distribution along all plots. Microscale modeling using CFD simulation was then utilized to properly optimize the distribution and location of cooling outlets and fine tune the cooling load for critical design conditions as identified by DTM. A 3D model for the project was built within a seven by four kilometers wind tunnel in order to properly represent the wind and its effect on the walkway area. Several scenarios were studied as well for, the, for these scenarios. As for the mesh, a lot of refinement had to be done within the occupied region in order to capture all the cooling outlets and other high influence features. As mentioned earlier, a pre-assessment study was done to check the air pattern around the central spine and the sufficiency of the proposed landscape features. From the results, it was observed that a lot of hot air infiltration is coming from the areas in between buildings, which flushes the cold air. In order to better preserve the cooling, trees and low-level shrubs around the buildings were suggested. After implementation of, the old, uh, of all uh, of the proposed mitigation measures, whether passive, such as optimized landscape and shading, or active as strategically placing the totems, uh, would optimize flow air and supply temperature. The designated areas uh, were uh, the designated, sorry, the air velocities and comfort conditions were achieved. At the end, we managed to achieve the target, which was providing outdoor comfort condition at the world's largest open air retail during 97% of the year. Thank you. Thanks, Dalia. Thank you. That's Sorry for talking so quickly. <laughs> no, it's a lot to cover uh, about a very complex topic in yeah. five minutes, so thank, thank you. You. Um, you mentioned that you reached the target for 97% of the time. What was the criteria that you... Yeah, the criteria against? was, uh, actually, it was uh, 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 the, the client wanted to uh, go for 90, uh, sorry, 80, uh, 28 uh, degrees SAT plus or minus uh, 2 degrees. The SATD. This, is, this was the target. Okay, and if I have time for another one, um, did you also consider any seasonal wind um, influences? So I, I saw that the wind rose was for the whole year, but were there any seasonal 
differences for like the summertime or was the wind coming from the uh, same direction? We, we try, we, based on the DTM modeling that was conducted, uh, the DTM uh, provided several critical wind conditions uh, on which we did the study and we did several CFD models to cover the whole year and several uh, critical scenarios. So yes, seasonal as well uh, was considered. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Ready? Yeah. Yeah. Good afternoon. Thank you for having me. My name is Dan Benson. Today I'll be talking about a project in which I've used daylight simulation modeling to influence the architecture of a building and provide operational advice. The images on screen are the two primary influences for a new building which makes available a large collection of oil paintings set within a beautiful landscape. The architectural vision is to retain and celebrate the connection with the landscape and to blur the lines between display and storage by utilizing the storage racks as shown on the right. What are the implications of this vision? Naturally, to enjoy a piece of artwork, we need to be able to see it. But the light enabling us to see that artwork also damages the pigments in the artwork, causing irreversible fading over time. The rate of fading is proportional to light exposure, which is measured in kilolux hours. It's the product of illuminance and time. For oil paintings, we try to limit the exposure to around 600 kilolux hours per year. Our proposed building is a single space with entirely glazed facades to the north and south, allowing the viewer to see straight through the building into the landscape beyond. The space will be fitted with a row of storage racks to the north facade, each of which can be independently dragged out for display and back in for storage. The challenge was to determine how to make such a heavily glazed and naturally bright space perform from a conservation standpoint. The building simulation hypothesis was to assess the annual light exposure against permutations in the building's form. Geometry was created in Rhino, which was then read into Grasshopper. Honeybee acts as the interface with the ray tracing engine, which is Radiance. Python is then used for post-processing that data, and visualizations were created in Rhino, Excel, Python, and Photoshop. Here we see the first iteration of the model, in which an overhanging roof was proposed to shade direct sunlight and manage the natural light levels within the space. I wanted to be able to quickly alter the form of the roof and see how that translated into the annual exposure. To do so, I've created that roof parametrically with independent sliders to control the depth of the north overhang and the depth and the angle of the south overhang. The simulation assessed the four racks shown in the vignette. Each square is colored based on its annual exposure. The preliminary analysis highlighted three key things. First of all, roof overhangs are an essential part of the design in order to avoid complete reliance on blinds. But since much of the exposure actually occurs outside occupied hours, we did in fact recommend automatic blinds that come down to limit unnecessary exposure when there's no one in the building to see the paintings. Finally, it was observed that the storage racks along the north facade exhibit a degree of self-shading, and to leverage this effect, we proposed external shading fins. With these measures, we expect that the building will achieve compliance with the conservation limit. Here is the design at stage two, and the eagle-eyed amongst you will notice that the banana-shaped building has flipped around. Thankfully, having designed this in Rhino and Grasshopper, this was a really easy fix. A flaw in the initial methodology was that I considered only one display arrangement, but a key part of the scheme is the ability to drag out, display, drag out and display artwork freely. It was felt that these are the most likely groups of displays, the four you can see on screen, each to be shown for about one month at a time. A restrictive schedule, such as you must use display group A in January, followed by B, and so on, seems to be at odds with this idea of flexibility. So I've run four separate annual simulations for each of these display groups, and then taken the worst case average annual exposure for each of the rack positions. In this way, the results are independent of any operation schedule. Here are the results for a typical rack. I felt that showing the heat map in the context of the space made it a lot easier for the client to understand a fairly abstract concept. 
And this graph shows the annual exposure at each rack position. So the dotted red line is the target. Below that is good, and you can see most of the racks achieve the conservation limit. But importantly, the two racks on either end exceed that limit, and so should only be used for interpretive text or otherwise light insensitive artwork. Finally, these heat maps tell the same story, but they go further in that they illustrate the spatial variation for a given rack. In summary, the daylight simulation that I've undertaken has influenced the architecture of the building through overhangs and shading fins, and it's given the client the tools they need to manage their collection through blinds and a clear instruction on how much display is permitted. Thank you. Oh. Oh, that was loud. So you considered daylight. Um, what about solar gain? Yeah, so I'm actually working as a project engineer on, on, this, uh, on this building. Um, so solar gain has been considered elsewhere. Um, we actually approached it from a daylight point of view. First, we solved this problem. And then from then, I've then gone on to the solar gains problem, which has, in fact, resulted in a number of other problems. But yeah, you know how it is. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Um, can you hear me? Uh, so today I'll be presenting my BST award submission, uh, Integrated Modeling Workflow for the Retrofit of an Office Building, Bourne Business Park, uh, Building 100. Uh, the, building, uh, the project is a refurbishment of a two-story office building uh, with a retained concrete, uh, concrete frame and one added floor. Uh, the design overall included a high-performing envelope, a highly energy-efficient all-electric air-conditioning system, mixed mode ventilation approach, uh, full LED lighting with daylight controls, uh, submetering uh, of uh, all plant equipment and floors, and a maximized PV installation. Our scope for this project was to provide overall design uh, advice with a particular focus on shading and facade optimization, optioneering, and energy strategy feasibility studies, supporting modeling for uh, tasks such as thermal comfort modeling, daylight, and patel, and also uh, putting together a uh, operational energy modeling that would then conclude in a full uh, neighbor's DFP assessment awarding the building with five and a half stars. Um, the way we approached the tool selection was aimed at being able to provide timely and robust feedback, early fabric uh, and operational performance analysis, uh, the possibility to do complex scenario modeling, uh, interoperability between tools where that was possible, uh, parameterization for ease of uh, scenario testing, and also being able to have a single platform uh, for stage three and stage four detail modeling. At early stage two, modeling included uh, uh, modeling with SketchUp, design pH and PHPP to be able to understand energy demands, uh, carry out feasibility testing of different options, and also uh, define the targets for the project specifically. Um, apologies for that. Uh, through that uh, combination of tools, we were able to test different performance specifications that gave us a clear idea on uh, uh, heating and cooling demands and also being able to compare that against uh, potential costs. We also did a number of uh, studies on different ventilation options, including a fully mechanical ventilation uh, scenario and two scenarios with mixed mode. Uh, this study uh, showed us that uh, it was possible by utilizing the mixed mode ventilation approach to realize significant energy savings on uh, cooling and ventilation uh, demands. Finally, uh, at stage two, we also wanted to test the impact of these uh, options on the net zero carbon potential for the building. So we built a TM54 model like at early stage using PHPP, uh, where uh, inputs were largely aligned with the neighbor's DFP defaults. Uh, this study also showed what uh, the previous steps uh, had indicated, that mixed mode ventilation was able to shift uh, the energy performance of the building uh, to different uh, UKDBC net zero carbon brackets, and that led to the decision to um, take that on board and uh, keep it within the design. Uh, the ease of manipulation of uh, the geometry uh, using SketchUp allowed us to do quick uh, uh, model updates in uh, stage three. Uh, in SketchUp and then carrying over the model to Rhino in order to carry out a daylight assessment using Grasshopper uh, and Honeybee. Uh, this parametric model allows us to test uh, different scenarios on materiality and glazing performance. 
And ultimately, this uh, daylight assessment uh, fed into Briam, but also gave us the opportunity to understand better the daylight control um, uh, conditions that we had to implement uh, for the perimeter zones that we had defined uh, in the building by reviewing the lax levels uh, that these zones received. Uh, during stage two and stage three, uh, task platforms were used uh, to carry out additional uh, performance analysis and fit into the design. Apologies for that. Fit into the design uh, by carrying out tasks such as uh, thermal comfort analysis, partial modeling, um, and thermal loads. Um, in stage three, uh, the task model. Uh, was used to build a preliminary TM54 model that would inform the potential neighbor's rating. Uh, it's, uh, the level of detail uh, uh, as we moved on to stage four was increased uh, to incorporate the actual performance details such as uh, actual ventilation rates in the floors, uh, systems and sizes of components, uh, product specific parameters such as um, uh, temperature correction factors that would inform the seasonal efficiency of the plant equipment for heating and cooling. Um, and ultimately, it led to the formal DFP assessment. Um, one last thing that we did was to uh, include risk scenarios where the mixed mode ventilation, uh, no mixed mode ventilation was one of them. Uh, and it, uh, it verified the findings of the stage two analysis that mixed mode is quite effective in realizing the margins. Last thing that is worth noted, uh, noting is that the assessment between stage two and stage four gave very similar cooling demands. Uh, that verified that the value of this integrated working uh, modeling workflow uh, could lead the, uh, the decision-making process and guide the design all the way from stage two to stage four. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, yeah, the first question would be, what was the driver in the early design stage for the optimization? Uh, the drive for that was actually to try and define uh, where within the UK GPC net zero carbon framework we could realistically land. And by carrying out detailed stage two modeling, where we would be looking at both fabric optimization and also early stage analysis on actual operation and energy, could give us a clear idea of ranges of performance. And the selection of the tools was made based on that, trying to see which can provide a quick feedback, but also robust enough to know that we don't have a 50 kilowatt hours per meter squared uh, range, but something much more specific. And uh, how was the daylight modeling impacted to the uh, system specifications? Uh, that actually informed uh, how we would implement the daylight control. So from a daylight performance point of view, as I said, it fed into Briam assessment. But for a deep plan office like that, it was expected that the daylight factor results would not be adequate to give uh, the ratings, but it allowed us to understand the thresholds of lax levels to control when the daylight would actually dim down and where we would uh, actually need it to be in and uh, also define the depths of the zones. So, so. Yeah, just a final question. On the workflow you have, mm -hmm. How well did you manage the interoperability between the different software? Uh, interoperability was actually implemented from the transition from SketchUp to Rhino for the daylight. Other than that, there's not a huge uh, communication between all the different tools, if I have to be honest. But it was uh, also a process where we knew that we could start building on the detail and the tools allowed for that. So early SketchUp model uh, allowed us to uh, model just the envelope and the fabric and have the opportunity to do quick updates and tests and then built into the actual layouts in Rhino and then ultimately moving into TAS, uh, developing further details into you know, the thermal conditions of the zones and so on. So interoperability per se was between SketchUp and Rhino, but still that was able to save us time. Thank you very much. I'm Julia Mackey, I'm a technical consultant at Helsin Moran, and I'm here today to talk about my computational fluid dynamic work on thermal comfort within a lobby space. Um, but it required a more slightly outside the box approach because due to the design of the doorway, um, the heating and cooling strategy success was very dependent on the outside wind domain. So it was yeah, a case of how do I 
how, how do we factor in the chaotic nature of wind and combine that with a thermally conditioned controlled indoor space? So the building in question is 20 Ropemaker Street. Um, it's currently under construction. It's a 27-storey building just on the fringe of the City of London. And it pushes the boundaries as a sustainable landmark building, um, having achieved three amounts standing at the design stage, and it's set to achieve a uh, well platinum rating. And um, part of the success of this was its um, accessibility strategy, leading the way for inclusive design. Um, so I'm going to, yes, and basically CFD was shown to be a very impactful tool in the design process around this. So um, when I mentioned that access to, so Hilson Moran worked with Make Architects to engineer this accessibility strategy so that thermal comfort would be achieved without compromising energy use too much. Um, the reason being that the proposed solution was for this drum door, so a set of sliding doors. Um, and previously, the long-standing approach was a revolving door with a pass door, the idea being that revolving doors really keep that outside domain out, um, just infiltration levels of wind. Um, and the reasoning was Islington Council's policy on accessibility. So um, it stipulates that all users of the building should be able to use the same entrance without being separated. So yeah, you know, not having to use a pass, separate pass door. So. The problem is, slight problem, um, when you have this door opening, you're effectively introducing an uh, opening in the facade, and you can lead, it can lead to this wind tunnel effect. So just the drive and pressure effects of the wind, um, stack effects can come into it well, but this is what we were keen to avoid. You just don't want, particularly in the winter, this mass of cold air moving into space and compromising, compromising things. So this is the geometry plan, an isometric view there. So you've got this double space height just after the entrance. So just looking at this one single door, and it leads into lift lobbies and general circulation afterwards. So highlighted here is the seating area, and this is what we're most concerned about, because you can see is this direct potential for direct path for the wind to hit that space there. So the question was how to, how to combine the two. So start, yeah, so started with wind modeling. Um, using ANSYS software and ESDU methodology for wind profiles that captures the terrain changes and roughness, um, a 700 meter domain here. Um, and the idea was capture these wind dynamics. Um, so this is just a vertical slice, just demonstrating some of the fancy plots we can do, velocity here, and then focus more at the doorway. Because um, without CFD, it'll be very it was well, very difficult to protect predict these dy dynamics because it's so dependent on the wind's interaction with the unique surrounding architecture and the building itself. Um, so I'm just going to quickly run through what they showed. It was the, the wind testing was very, very impactful in this design because it actually surprisingly showed that not, not many wind weather conditions would lead to wind being drawn, uh, driven into the lobby. Um, and this is just an illustration where for the prevailing wind, you can see the stag stagnation point. You've got circulating flow. It was basically where you've got this recessed entrance drawing air out of the lobby much of the time. And just an illustration here of the streamlines channeling down the facade. Because um, the geometry of the building itself actually lent itself to mean that most of the flow was tangential across this doorway. So it generated a region of low pressure and suction. And here we can just see um, there was only one wind direction which generated that drove flow in here, um, just from the leeward side, circulation, circulating in here. But actually, it wasn't for all wind speeds. When you have fast, fast enough speeds, that would just flow across the doorway and, again, lead to suction out, which wasn't an issue. Um, and so from, yeah, we're interfacing the box outside for the wind domain to interface it with the thermal lobby model. Um, just run through this now. So drum door design, modeled the HVAC um, supply grills, and occupant gains, but basically this is the, the, the fancy, can I click on this? So yeah, this for that wind, one wind direction, it was basically the combination of the outdoor chaotic wind nature, combining it with a thermal space, um, and just seeing how that massive cold air would move in. It was really informative for informing them the HVAC design, basically. Um, as you can see, it's deflecting. Great. Um, and just a few more plots. Um, just other things to consider. We also had to be conscious of suspended ceiling features. So not just thermal comfort, 
what else could it impact? And then this is just for the summer design, um, which wasn't shown to be an issue because it warm air would rise up and it actually provided welcome mixing from the draft. Um, thank you. Thanks, Julia. Um, in terms of the outputs you got, uh, was it velocity, air temperature, were there any other ones? Um, yes, so the main measure we were looking at was operative temperature, so sorry. Um, the main measure was operative temperature, so factoring dry bulb, the radiant feedback from the walls. Um, so there's a bit of DTM modeling in there as well to determine surface temperatures um, and the air movement. So those were our main, main two, the velocity and the operative. Did you look at draft risk? Or draft rating as well? Uh, so drafts, um, yes. Yeah. Yeah, so because that was our main main issue with that, just the mass of cold wind creeping across the floor there, um, and there's really not much you can do. I forgot to mention there were heated supplies in that drum door, um, just to you know aid aid mixing, get the temperature up a bit. But there's only so much it can do in terms of a defensive barrier when you've got those momentums involved. Um, so we did end up advising more, maybe obstructive mitigation like a, a screen for the seating area. Um, and low-level heating, so integrated fixed spaces into the furniture, uh, just to more aid the mixing off, aid the recovery, as opposed to how can we block it. Uh. Great, sorry. <laughs> so the next one is going to be a pre-recorded video. Hopefully it works. Now watch 2023. I'm Prithvi and let's see how to ensure resilience through integrated parametric simulation. The DATNS house in Utrecht is one of the largest and oldest hospitals in the Netherlands and it consists of a collection of buildings of several periods. In order to respond smartly and efficiently to the rapidly changing health care demand, a major innovation is necessary to make the hospital future. We were the project managers and sustainability consultants and MEP consultants for the expansion of BKC, Women and Child Center. The hospital's master plan was meticulously crafted with great care. It will be renovated in phases so that the complete design will be realized by 2055. Despite the initial projections of high greenhouse gas emissions by 2100, smart policies and clean energy efforts have lowered our emissions. However, the scientific community insists on further reduction to limit the temperature and increase to 1.5 degrees Celsius, and that requires consistent and periodical interventions. And such interventions are the results from the decisions made by the experts, consultants, and stakeholders through regular meetings and exchanging emails. However, the values of these decisions are unevenly distributed in a traditional approach, despite the best efforts to implement effective interventions. In contrast, integrating expertise and expectations from diverse stakeholders into a central parametric digital model fosters a comprehensive understanding of decisions and their impact among each other. This method of systems thinking ensures a more equitable distribution of value. In our role as project managers, we gather the design inputs and expected outcomes from designers, consultants and clients Utilizing Grasshopper and Honeybee with Excel, we loaded these data points and developed a parametric model in community and applied the results with post-processing in Excel. These results were further validated using Design Builder and once validated, these results would be shared online and the link was available to the team. This process formed an iterative loop accommodating additional input and output requests based on the evolving results. Our inputs explored seven facade designs with varying insulation, glass specification, and glass specification across different orientations, and the cost for all the components were integrated into the model setting. And the various installations were also explored. The results encompassed building aesthetics, energy demand, ground balance, daylighting, and the total associated costs. And finally, we ended up simulating over 5,200 motions. The online dashboard using the Design Explorer showcases both the final results and all the available options. Users can analyze these results by applying filters either on the input or on the outputs. By adding more filters, a handful of options arrives for further exploration of other aspects such as building results. 
ultimately, the outcomes are explored by various partners. Like architects focused on analyzing the design at the input level, emphasizing larger glass percentage and all variations without overhand system. And the MEP consultants aim to reduce heating and cooling demand for enhanced energy efficiency. And RTC calculation will be the choice of an ATIS system is economical and efficient in the long run. So, the ESCO wanted to ensure that design would have a decent ground balance during the heating and cooling periods. Given the healthcare nature of the project, the sustainability consultant prioritized adequate access to daylight and outside. The cost imposed on the contractors in the ESCO facilitated estimating construction and operational costs over a 30 period time until 2015. This comprehensive approach allowed the client to make financially feasible decisions for a better return on investment over time, ultimately guiding the selection of the final design based on the desired outputs from all the stakeholders. And here are the handful of options that underwent further analysis leading us to identify the final optimal design. Some of the reflections we have in this journey is, is that creating an iterative workflow facilitates the incorporation of numerous design changes. The collaboration among the stakeholders is evident both within their respective groups and collectively. The simulation has brought clarity to our ambitions and delineated the necessary steps for realizing the vision for 2050. The scalability of this approach extends to other sectors also, accommodating the inclusion of additional stakeholders. The ongoing efforts are focused on Refining the assessment of embodied carbon and delivering the detailed cost calculations. Thank you for listening and I look forward to any questions. Hello everyone. Hello. Hi. Um, thank you so much for your presentation of taking the time Sorry, to... Yeah. Can Did you guys able to hear it? Actually, I couldn't hear anything. Yes, yes. Can, can you hear us? Yeah, it's loud and clear. Say that again? It's loud and clear. Okay. okay. Can, um, can, you hear the, can you hear me? Because I'm about to ask a question. Oh, here. Okay. Oh, I can hear you. So I had a question. Oh, I had a question. So in terms of the uh, optimization, I was wondering how you decided the different criteria that you would choose as being optimal for your design. Oh, that's, a, that's a great question, actually. Well, the interesting part is we didn't choose any of those criteria. Actually, we know uh, we are in sustain, we are in MEP and sustainability experts, and we know our values. But we try to get uh, the expected values from the different stakeholders because they are the experts in their own fields. And our job is only to try to collect or convince, the work, convince this workflow and collect the data points from them. And could you have minimized the number of options in that case? No, uh, the number of options could have, no, that's uh, running between 3,000 or 5,000 options is not an issue because it's since it's automated, the computer or the central server takes care of the simulation. So options was never an issue. Number of, number of options was never an issue. Hello, thank you. Uh, did you have access to the existing hospital data? What was the uh, saving uh, or the existing hospital with the new proposed one? Yes, uh, since we were the project managers for the development, uh, one, uh, one key advantage or one edge we had is to access to all the data. So with the help of project managers in our team, I was able to access all the data points that are relevant to the project. So that made uh, that made like uh, base case decisions a bit easier. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. Thank you for sorry uh, for sudden change of events. I needed to be here in COP28, and uh, I'm glad to be part of the presentation at least. Hello, good afternoon. Is that clear enough? You okay? Hi, I'm Ross Bolton. I'm an associate at Bureau Happold in the Sustainability and Physics team. 
I'm here to present our uh, approach to simultaneous daylighting, overheating, and operational energy, aka PAR-L in the UK. Uh, studies that support um, new build residential facade design at early stage. So to set the scene of the project where we've developed and implemented this process, uh, we were collaborating and working with Lansec on a new build residential development in North London and um, taking the scheme to a planning stage, uh, uh, Reba stage two. Uh, stop me if you've seen this before, but in the last two years, we've had a huge amount of change to the regulation and policy, particularly in the UK and England and Wales. We've had conflicting requirements from daylighting, overheating, operational energy, and increasingly whole life carbon as well. All of these parameters are pulling the facade design in different directions, and it's been really difficult to find a way through that maze. And not just difficult for consultants, also for clients. How on earth can they make clear decisions about what they want the facade to look like within this context? Now, whoops, sorry. So they are asking very specific questions at such an early stage because the facade design is fixed at planning. There's very little scope to change it after that. And all of these questions are quantitative, right? You can't really answer these questions with best practice, with guidance, etc. You can say, oh, maybe slightly like this. No. The cheesy graphic shows the key is simulation here. This gives you uh, the actual answers to these questions um, to properly optimize the scheme. Now, uh, we end up specifically with this trilemma of overheating, daylighting, and energy. Um, and we focused our uh, assessments on this at the moment, but we look to integrate other aspects, including building performance and embodied carbon and cost in the future. Um, our Bureau Hubble's response to this trilemma is to create a coordinated and sort of consolidated workflow across all three of these analyses. And we've chosen our uh, software um, usage here quite specifically so that we're able to assess um, the compliance with the associated standards in a detailed way. So there's no sort of proxy metrics here. The assessments are actual compliance, assessment, uh, compliance assessments um, that you could sort of hang your hat on. Now this gives clients um, confidence in the results that you're getting. But we've also streamlined the process and once it's uh, automated across all three of those workflows, then it's also scalable. So instead of going iterative or what if that, what if this, we set a workshop right at the beginning and we say, okay, what parameters do you want to check? Do you want to look at glazing ratio, specification, et cetera? Okay, well, we can just simulate all of those things and bring all of those results back together in a single interactive 3D tool. Um, so the parameters that we studied for Finchley Road, for example, included uh, many of the things I've said, so glazing ratio, G-value, VLT, uh, shading, window opening, et cetera. Um, and all of these things were uh, simulated in combination. So we ended up with 2,500 or so uh, different, different iterations assessed across all three metrics as well. Um, and then the the sort of crowning jewel of it is to bring all of that analysis and all of the inputs together in a single tool uh, that you can workshop and sort of interact with as a client and designer and an architect. So we can sit with the tool and say, you know, what, what design decisions do you want to make? And, and then they can see live the impact that that has on the compliance assessment across all three metrics. Um, it also gives uh, sort of feedback of what the design decisions feel like. So here, for example, we have an action shot of different window glazing configurations, and we can flick through different options, and so we can see not only the results, not only the inputs, but also like that architectural feel, right? And um, ultimately, all of this is working to make design decisions a lot clearer for developers, which will deliver better housing and, and faster, ultimately. And uh, thank you very much.
Thanks, Ross. Um, what's the validation process uh, for the simulations that you have? I'm yep. curious so to just understand the, the process of sense checking and QA. Absolutely. Um, it's been a big part of <laughs> my role on this, for sure. So um, we will be with spot check um, a selection of various simulations um, for each of the analyses. So we'll do sort of a visual check and, and QA of each of those things, but also looking at trends across the entire analysis. So um, there's individual checks and also a, you know, checking to see whether you see the right trend uh, based on the different parameters. Hello, thank you. Hi. Uh, you mentioned about using three different platforms for the simulations. So where the optimization comes into play? Um, so the optimization, I guess, comes in multiple forms. Uh, optimization for the consultant, for, for us, we can do things faster because uh, using Bureau Hapold's sort of uh, code base, the BOM, um, we can run all of these simulations using the same sort of coordinated um, inputs. The optimization from a sort of design uh, team and client's perspective is that they can just sort of live check what different options they want to see. You know, uh, so many times I've been in scenarios where they've said, okay, well, what about if, if I do this, will this be compliant? And uh, frankly, you have to go away and two weeks later you come back with no, right? Whereas now we can say, okay, these are the compliant options. But equally, we can say those, don't, those options don't work. And the client can have confidence around the result ultimately and how you've got there. Thank you. Um, I'm just going to kickstart our first result for the Young Modeler Award. Then you, um, I have to say it's my favorite category because it brings a lot of enthusiasm to, to our group and to the industry. Oopsie. OK. Change of plan. I'm not going to present the results yet. <laughs> I'm just going to present the short list in few for um, as of yet. Yeah. I think I would. Um, yes, starting with DV Anshu Sud from University College of London, uh, Imogen Brown at Savile's Earth, uh, Ranjith Jana Payan uh, Nair from Design Builder Software, and Yushian Huang from Foster and Partners. So I'll keep you waiting for the moment. Where did Alex go? Yeah. Where did Alex go? I think we're on to the next part, which is our panel discussion with our chair kickstarting that. So these are our sponsors. Um, we, I'll introduce them um, one by one, or they can introduce themselves when they come up. And they're going to be talking about future innovation of building simulation. So the first of our sponsors is um, Design Builder, Renjef. Hello everyone, I'm, uh, I'm Ranjit from Design Builder. So Design Builder, as you know, is a multidisciplinary, multi fully integrated simulation toolbox. It, it's fully integrated in the sense that it allows you to uh, use the gold standard uh, simulation engines like Energy Plus and Radiance uh, to do all the analysis that you can see here on the screen. So you can use uh, Design Builder's modeling tools to create the model within Design Builder or import it using in different formats. You can use it to do uh, daylight simulations to generate reports for Briam, Bleed. You can use the visualization tools for solar analysis, uh, uh, generate rendered views for reports, shading analysis. And Design Builder is uh, the most mature interface to Energy Plus, 
and it allows you to do thermal simulations, load calculations, uh, model detailed HVAC systems, and also do uh, certification and uh, compliance work, uh, whether it's for LEED, PRIAM, ASHRAE 90.1, or UK PARTEL and EPCs. Our sophisticated tools uh, also allows you the scripting, uh, advanced scripting tools allows you to use it to customize your uh, models to perform in a way that would actually perform in the uh, perform in reality. And also, we we have fully integrated sensitivity, uh, uncertainty parametric, and optimization tools that allows you to do cost optimizations, risk analysis, etc. And also, you can do uh, life cycle cost and life cycle analysis using the same model itself. Now, moving on to the immediate future, we recently released our new uh, design build a climate analytics tool. Climate is often uh, is often underrated in simulations, and with the climate analytics tool, you can download climate files, including future, actual, uh, typical, and design weather files for more than 443,000 locations. You can also download uh, weather files for custom locations as well. And from immediate future to uh, long-term future, so in addition to Energy Plus and uh, Radiance, you will all, uh, we, we are also integrating open form with this builder, so this will enable you to do use all those gold standard engines within this builder using the same model, and you can uh, do the CFT analysis as well. Thank you. Thank you, Enjith. I'd now like to invite Ian to talk um, about his. Thank you. <laughs> um, Alex asked me to um, put down my thoughts on what we might see in the next 20 years um, in terms of dynamic simulation modeling. Um, so I think we've, we've covered a little bit of, bit of this already. Um, certainly in, in the last 10 years, we've seen a massive increase in GPU performance. I mean, I think this is primarily because the gaming industry is now bigger than films and TV put together, so there's clearly a lot of money in it. Um, but the, the nice thing is, um, these things are incredibly good at linear algebra, so they're really good at vector and matrix calculations, um, to the extent that you, you almost sometimes find yourself um, contemplating suboptimal algorithms purely because they can take advantage of, of this massive parallel, parallelization. Um, so, you know, I think, ultimately, um, we're going to see the use of, of um, neural networks, um, particularly for things like optimum start. So this is the case where you're trying to figure out, as the building is cooling down, when to start the thing up. Um, and it's a classic for neural network training, because you can get a lot of data about previous runs. So every morning, you've got that input data and then you can train the, the neural network off the previous experiences. Um, an even better one um, is the fact that once it's trained and it's operating, it can then assess how it's been performing, and it can use that data to continue to learn. So these things are just continually reinforcing the learning that they've had before. Um, so ultimately, I think from a controls point of view, um, you know, neural networks could be a massive improvement in terms of all of these systems, and consequently, will give quite substantial energy savings, which brings me back to the simulation, which can tell you how much that's going to be. So and another nice thing, um, the simulations can act as a kind of kickstarter for the neural network. So you can take 20 years of previous weather data continuously, not just one, you can do a whole 20-year batch um, and some perhaps predicted weather. Um, and from there, you can get your, 
neural network at least up and running, and then it can start to self-learn. Um, we've also got these large language models, um, which are basically really, really clever um, mechanisms for gaining access um, to tools like ChatGPT, which is a terrifying thing from my perspective as a programmer. I never thought I'd be redundant, but I just typed in, could you write me some code to work out the square root of a number using the secant method? And it just produced pretty flawless Fortran. Then it produced flawless C++, um, and then it did it in Lisp, which is just mind-bending for me <laughs> when you look at it, look at the output. Um, so yeah, I think there's, there's a lot of potential um, in our industry um, at the moment. Um, this is a nice chart because it shows just how incredible Moore's law is that you know, every two years you're doubling performance and GPUs are just going to keep doing that. So I, I don't see any, any difference. I've covered quite a lot of these issues. One of the biggest ones is latency, transferring data to and from the CPU to the GPU. So the GPU can do things blindingly quick but if you've got to throw a huge great matrix at it, which it will gobble up, and then, okay, the result coming back isn't too bad, but you can end up with, with certain tasks which you're actually better off leaving on the CPU, um, and then other tasks which are most definitely worth palming off, um, for sure. Um, and again, thanks to the gaming industry, we've got the radiant exchange calculations, which are very time consuming on a CPU. But because you've got kids playing games and they want to see realistic shadows, they want to see all of the, the reflections, you know, again, absolutely perfect for, for that type of calculation. And not just visual, it's, it's the long wave radiation, the, the mean radiant temperature stuff as well. So again, massive improvements coming there. Um, I think I've pretty much covered that as well. And this is the optimum start. So you've got your building cooling down, which is the dashed line, and then you've got to figure out when to actually fire the thing up. Um, in this instance, it's a really nice, simple output layer. So neural networks tend to work with, a, with a, an input layer, which is all of the properties, you know, previous hours weather data, what's gone on in the building previously. And in this instance, it funnels right down to a simple binary, yay or nay. You know, do I turn on this out or do I turn on this 15 minute interval, um, which, is, which is great. Um, and again, I, I strongly suspect if they're not already working on it, people like Trend and other control systems guys must be thinking along these lines. If I've thought of it, I'm sure they are. Um, good. That's, that's it from me. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Ian. If I can now... Oh, this was your one, wasn't it? Yeah. If I can now invite Niall up. Thanks, Darren. <clears throat> um, yeah, thanks for having us up here. I've been told I've got two minutes to try and summarise. Um, so, uh, with IES, you normally associate uh, ISVE with us um, in, t in terms of what we do. Uh, but actually, IES have a, a mission to decarbonize um, uh, the entire built environment of the world. And I suppose one of the big things is, um, of course, we fully develop the VE, and that will be evolving, as you would expect. Um, but actually, the, uh, the problems of today is, is, is quite different to the, the, the problems that we were facing like five or 10 years ago, okay? So we need to be thinking about what we're doing in the space, not just um, uh, prediction and optimization of buildings that we're, uh, of new buildings that we're um, bringing to the world, but what we're doing with the existing building stock um, and not just looking at that problem as individual buildings, but multiple buildings, okay? And so, so we uh, developed technology, uh, to complement the virtual environment, uh, to answer these things, uh, all driven uh, at, at the very core of, of, of using building simulation of what we do here all the time. Uh, interestingly, you're talking about um, uh, AI and uh, mach machine learning, and that is absolutely the future of, of, of where we are just now. Right? So everybody in this room who is uh, proficient in building simulation, that is absolutely the next step that you're going to be going into. Um, we, we are developing, we're working, uh, 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 quite a substantial part of our R&D is, is in this area, and it is, it is the question to do it. 
That's me, yep. How soon? Uh, so we, 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 we are actually, we all, we're already as a company delivering projects um, uh, using those techniques through our first wave, through our consultancy teams. Uh, but commercially, in terms of um, uh, using Apache and, and, and doing that, um, you will see probably the, around about next summer, you'll start to see that technology coming through. Okay, so we have, um, I don't want to give, I don't want to spill too many secrets, you know, I don't, you know, you've got secret sauce, right? I don't want to just be giving it away to my, uh, to my colleagues over here. Uh, but uh, one of the big things here is, um, for example, when you're dealing with uh, data from buildings in operation, uh, what we want to do is be able to bring that, that building data uh, and merge that maybe into the, our uh, design for performance model. So move away those predictions and put in actual uh, uh, data. Now, if you were doing that manually just now, it's going to take you days, weeks, maybe a couple of weeks to do that in a building. Uh, whereas we've got a technique using AI to do that within maybe a couple of hours. Okay, and that's the kind of thing that you're going to see um, uh, start of next summer. Uh, so anyway, that was um, that's just a wee glimpse into the into the future. All right, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Noel. Our final speaker is uh, Alex from Monodraft. Hi, so I'm not going to talk too much about building modelling because it's not actually something I really get involved with, although our company, sorry, although our company does use it. Oh, that's confusing. <laughs> but anyway, I've only recently joined Monodraft, so I've only been there for four months. Uh, and the main reason I joined was their commitment to net zero. Uh, currently moving forward, all our products are going to be net zero. And what do we mean by that? So effectively, every product that's manufactured will have an embodied carbon uh, to do with movement of the components from various parts of the world, putting it together as well as then shipping it to site. Uh, and we actually have a UN accreditation scheme um, that anyone can go on who uses our products find their project and see exactly what we've offset on their behalf and they can then use that for their own marketing or just for their just to see for themselves what we've done on their behalf and on top of that we also have operational carbon that we offset uh, and this is obviously the electricity run to use the fans um, and yeah and on behalf of monodraft also i just wanted to congratulate all the finalists um, for the projects you've done and the work that you do and your commitment to the industry moving forward. Um, and yeah, as you'll see from the slide behind me, we try to factually record all the things that we do offset. Um, and the acuity centralized control that we use is exactly what the set point is. And from that, we can generate a report, either quarterly, weekly, even daily, and send it to customers so they have exact visibility uh, on how our systems are working. Uh, and we obviously we do model that with IES to start with and part of the our sending reports to our customers so that we can show them that the modeling that we're doing is correct and that the units are performing uh, as we said they would do um, and yeah I mean I did try to keep my project uh, my speech sorry down to um, a minute so yeah on behalf of Monroff I wanted to wish you all a happy Christmas and a prosperous new year Thank you very much. Um, before we move on to the presentation of the awards, we've got um, a few minutes, and we'd like to open the floor to any questions to our speakers. OK, I'll ask a question. So we have a COP28 going on at the moment. Um, it's obviously huge every time the COP comes round. And how do you see building simulation supporting what is a very, very challenging transitional period that, that we're actually getting into now. Ian, thanks. Hello. Is this one on? Yes. <laughs> uh, sorry, yes. COP and obviously what the governments are going to decide in terms of the way they're going to respond to climate change and the CO2 stuff. Um, I think 
primarily it is going to be legislation driven. Um, it is, I think, primarily the acts of government which are going to change um, the way that things work. And can simulation modeling help in that process? Of course. And, and vice versa. I mean, one of the big step changes for us was when the British government introduced the, the new Part L stuff back in the early 2000s. And that suddenly we became from being a sort of luxury good, if you like, to a mandatory piece of software that everybody had to have. And there's competition, lots of different ways of doing it, and a free government tool, which you would have thought would terrify us. Um, thankfully, not many people have decided to use that at the end of the day. So, yeah, it, I think it will be a legislation-driven thing, and, and that is going to come from governments, and hopefully from meetings like the COP stuff, that, that will generate change in, in, in legislation. So I've got prattling on now. Thank you. No, you? Um, yeah, in, in addition to that, um, I mean, look, we've got massive, we've got massive issues there in terms of the um, uh, the governance side, you know, King Charles talking about uh, we're falling behind, we're not going forward, you know, COP28 uh, being marred with oil deals and all that sort of thing. But uh, uh, I totally agree on the regulation side, it needs to be more. Uh, and it's great to see what everybody's doing today. Uh, from a technology side, we need to make it easier and faster. We need to be able to capture more volume, more quantity of uh, building stock, uh, more accuracy in, 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 in less time, you know? And um, uh, from our perspective, you know, that's, that's, that's what we're trying to do. We're di diversifying what building simulation actually means. Um, uh, and to try and tackle some of those uh, those problems. Thank you. And Jeff? I also agree with our colleagues uh, that okay. legislation will be one of the drives, but I also think that it's also up to us as software providers as well as modelers to use it. So uh, as one of the saying says that it's what get measured uh, uh, will get addressed. So, we have three software providers here who are providing excellent softwares which are easy and fast and more productive to use. So there are modelers out there who are efficient enough to model the buildings and meet the target of net zero carbon by 2050 or if possible earlier. So in addition to legislations, I think it's also about uh, educating uh, modelers on how how effectively they could use the softwares to address the challenges and also making the softwares also more easy, friendly, and productive to use. Okay, thank you. I'm told that we're short of time. Have you got anything you very quickly? You happy? Okay. So I'd like to thank the speakers. So, yeah. I think Daniel went to ask a question, so just go for it. But it's going to be one very short uh, response. Well, yeah? it's directed. Is that, is that working here? Yeah. Uh, Faraya, so you've got data coming back from a building from your digital twins. Is this something you've noticed um, that we as modelers consistently assume to be wrong? For example, occupancy profiles, you know, we're told, oh, it's 30 people, and you notice every single time it's not that. Maybe there's some other thing you've noticed. Um, you know, wh where, where are we most likely to get our assumptions about the real building wrong? Yeah, so I think I think the biggest thing here is about so so this calibrated modeling is quite uh, it's, it's quite a new a new front. Uh, so we've made everything up to now. Buildings are rated on assumption and prediction, and uh, what we need to do is close that gap. So the more we do that, the more we get an understanding of how buildings are actually used in real life, and then we can start using that as data sets and, and, and prediction. But uh, yeah, I mean this is like uh, a really exciting uh, a really exciting time on the calibration side. Uh, yeah, you can you can uh, you can maybe beta test it for us uh, uh, in a couple of months' time. That'd be good. Wait, sorry, I know you went correctly. Now we can thank the speakers. <laughs>
so I can show them to the rest of the crowd. They've been waiting there for so long. So there you go. They're all here, ready for the for the award. Yeah, I'm definitely our young model is deserve more spotlight. Uh, it's great to have you here or on screen. Um, so our award for the young model received the most entries that we've seen so far this year. It was pretty competitive. So well done to the shortlisted people. Um, and the competition for the top prize. Uh, places, sorry, it was really close. So starting off with a commendation for the award before uh, we go to the winner. Okay, so our commendation goes to Yushan Huang. I hope I pronounced that correct. Um, um, Yushan is a graduate uh, environmental design analyst at Foster and Partners, and um, we highly commended um, her advanced modeling building simulation skills um, throughout her submission, um, particularly her dedication and driving um, outdoor comfort analysis, um, which has shined through um, the tool that you developed, um, which looks at innovative hybrid uh, workflows for um, urban street thermal comfort assessment that also takes vegetation into account. Well done. And then on to the winner. <laughs> that was loud. <laughs> yeah, so our Young Model Award goes to Divyanshu Sud. I really hope I pronounced that correctly. Um, from University College of Dublin. So Divyanshu is doing a PhD at the University of uh, Dublin, uh, University College of Dublin, uh, looking at development of next generation residential building archetypes for energy analysis and different um, temporal and spatial scales. Um, he demonstrated through his um, um, entry a very strong uh, technical outlook on energy modeling topics uh, for residential archetyping, um, which included oc occupancy and envelope performance. And we recognize this as an area of high importance and significance in our, net, in our uh, energy transition context and decarbonization of large scale stocks and transformation uh, based on energy, um, accurate energy predictions. Um, but what set apart Yanshu was his dedication for knowledge sharing through various activities, conferences and training, uh, but also uh, using his energy simulation tools uh, for a charity aid. Uh, yeah, so well done Divyanshu. Anything you want to say? Just putting you on the spot here. The answer. Hi, everyone. Thank uh, Am I audible? Yes. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, thank, thank you so much for the, for, the, for, the, for the award. So, like, I'll keep continuing working in the building simulation and just try to achieve Try, try to do the work which can benefit the society and all the building energy modelers outside. Thank you so much for this. Thank you very much. You. And, now, and now you have to bear with me because the top secret is in my a USB stick. Don't open there, don't open there. Close your eyes. Hopefully nobody saw. Yes. So I don't know who is. All the judges to come up and then all together you can announce the award. Thanks very much um, for the entries. 
I have to say it was quite hard to judge. And so congratulate you, congratulations to you all for being shortlisted. Um, it's been a pleasure to listen to your presentations. Thanks so much for sharing your work. And we divided a bit, so each one of us is going to say a few words about the two runner-ups and the winner at the end. Hello, everyone. And our first runner-up is Daniel Benson. Congratulations. Uh, it was a really good way of representing daylight modeling, a very niche project and an outside-of-box case study. Thank you so much. Why not? <laughs> End up. Um, and our second runner-up today is uh, Dalia Khalil from uh, the DAR group. Um, we found her presentation to be interesting, innovative application that considered the interplay between outdoor environment systems and shading design. Well done, Dalia and our group. Thank you. So to the winner, um, there was a bit of a theme on some of the entries, and we had to decide on one. Um, so, without further ado, do you want to roll the drums or, yeah? <laughs> okay. The winner of the 2023 Building Simulation Awards is Georgios Coronaios from Savills. Um, congratulations, Georgios. We, we thought it was a very interesting approach to implementing the workflow, dealing with different tools and also an important project to show um, the approach towards decarbonization and retrofit. Um, we would love to see a bit more on embodied carbon considerations, but <laughs> that's my future <laughs> um, plan for you. But well done, well done to all of you. Um, it was really good, all of, all of the presentations. Thanks so much. Okay, so it's my job to uh, close the SIBC Building Simulation Awards 2023. Uh, thank you, and I'm always uh, wowed by the quality of the people and the skills that we see during these awards. Uh, we are uh, being recorded, so um, you'll be able to look again on the um, SIBC Building Simulation Group website and catch that. So uh, a big thank you to POM and the SIBC team um, for supporting us. A massive thank you to the judging team uh, led by Gabby here. There we go. Um, a big thank you to all the reviewers. There's a huge amount of uh, work gone. I've mentioned six months um, earlier. That's how much um, effort we put into this. And obviously a massive congratulations to all those shortlisted, your winners. Thank you very much. Um, obviously, we're, we're looking forward to um, many, many more people um, putting themselves forward uh, for next year, for the Builder Simulation Awards, into the two categories. And finally, uh, I can't say thank you without thanking our event secretary, Alex. Um, it runs smoothly because of Alex. So that closes the awards. Thank you.